Over the mountain, over, over the, the mountain, mountain. Ooh, to the deep end. Yeah. Don't you know that Jesus, Jesus has said I? Well, the Lord said I never leave you. Oh Lord, that's a Lord promise, that promise divine word. A promise that never, never can fail. fail. Oh, 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 heavenly, heavenly, y'all are nothing like the good old. Historically. And down through man's anthropological existence, God has always defined manhood. One of the major problems we have in the world, and even in the church, is how to define a man. Everybody has a different definition as it relates to defining what a real man is and what a real man does sisters if you ever want to make your man mad you would challenge his manhood when you don't want something when he's not doing something you want done and you would say something like if you were a real man Ye, do I have a witness in here? Sister Cobb, you in the house. And then you know because you're trying to get up under his skin. So we struggle with defining what a real man is and what a real man does. Another problem with defining uh, a man is the fact that our culture, somebody shout culture. Our culture, beloved, has gradually uh, began to try to define what a man is now as we seek to define what a real man is we must go to the word of God and allow the creator to define his creation because everybody has a different definition for what they believe a real man is am I right about it and so you may say that a real man should do this or real men should do that. Watch this. If we really want to be honest, even men have a problem with defining who they really are. Because a lot of men have never been taught who God says they are. Therefore, they don't have a good understanding of what manhood uh, and masculinity uh, is how it's defined in the word of God. So this morning, we're going to walk you through this thing because... What we're trying to do is we're trying to define uh, manhood and womanhood so that we could build the kind of relationships that God wants us to build. And if you don't know who God has you to be and who God wants you to be and what God wants you to do, you won't properly be able to define uh, who you are. And we have allowed culture to do that. So we're going to deal with that on this morning. Genesis chapter one. Uh, and verse number 27, notice this text. Then God said, somebody shout God said. Amen. Now God is talking. He said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. And let them rule over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the sky and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. In verse number 26, if it's on the screens, you can clearly see that God, somebody shout God. God had a conversation with himself and said, let us make man in our uh -huh. image is that right so god has a conversation with him uh jesus and the holy spirit which is the godhead and god made a declarative statement watch this to make man in his image god made man in his image that word image means a uh, likeness or form uh then he says according to his uh, likeness, which means a uh, similitude, resemblance. In other words, God wanted man to resemble him. Now, God internally made mankind with the need and ability to rule. If you notice the text, God says, and I want you to get this because you got to go a little bit deeper when you're thinking here. When God made mankind, he wanted mankind to be similar to him. His son, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit. That's why he said, let us make man 
in our image. And then he says that man, he says, let them rule. If you have a King James translation, it would say, let them have dominion. Which means that God knew that internally that you and I have a need and we have to have the ability, watch this, to rule over the resources that he created and provided on and in the earth. Notice what those recesses, resources are. Over the birds of the sky the fish of the sea over the cattle and over every creeping thing and over all the earth so he created man to have rule and dominion because he uh in in his likeness he has what rule and dominion over us he gave us rule and dominion over the resources that's on the earth and in the earth am i confusing anybody in other words if we're going to say that we resemble god and we're made in his likeness that simply means that we have the ability to have dominion over resources and the resources are right in the text right there. I don't want to belabor that point. But I wanted you to understand that God wants us to resemble him. And he uh, has given us dominion over those resources that the earth provides. And he has dominion over us. In verse number 27, God did what he said he would. Remember, he had a conversation with himself and he said, let us make man. Verse 27 says that he made man. Am I right about it? And so he did what he said he was going to do. And he, God created man. Which means that he shaped man, he formed man, and God only made and created, watch this, uh, everybody look at me, two genders. I, I don't have time to get on all that other stuff because I don't have time to do that. And the reason why I don't need to, because he only made two. There are no other genders, according to God. There is male. <laughs> That's it. Now, whether you want to look at the chromosomes, X, Y, whatever, you, you study that all you want. I'm satisfied with what tw verse 27 says, male and female. He meant somebody. Now, now, let me show you, church, uh, the detail of how God did it. I want to show you the detail of how God created man so that you can understand this. Now, when God created man, uh, you see in Genesis, and follow me, Brother Walla, Genesis 2. And verse number seven, then the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. Now, I'm going to give you seven P's for how God put the man together. Number one, in verse number seven, we know that uh, he created man from the what? From the dust of the ground. Which means that he put the man together. Is that right? So one of the seven P's is God put the man together. Next verse is number eight. Verse number eight says, God planted a garden for the man. And he placed him in the garden. All right. So now we got, he put them together. He planted a garden for him. And he placed the man where? In the garden. Verse number nine says that he provided for the man in terms of he gave the man trees to eat. Am I right about it? And he gave him trees for aesthetic beauty. So now we, we know that he put them together, planted a garden for him, placed them in the garden, and he provided for him because he gave him trees to eat. Am I right about it? And then number, verse number 15 says, now sisters, you're going to want to make sure you pay close attention to this one. The Bible says in verse number 15, uh, is it up there? Uh, then the Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to do what? To cultivate it. Okay, let me break it down in the BJV. He, he gave man a job. Uh, so, some of y'all sisters, you missed your first shout of the sermon. Let me say it one more time. He put him in the garden of Eden to do what? To cultivate the ground, to cultivate it. Notice the text. We, we skip over it. Then he says, and he said, he said, and do I? So he put them together, planted a garden for him, placed them in the garden, provided for him. Now he has given him a job, which means that he has given him a purpose. Somebody shout purpose. Having a job gives you 
purpose. And then he says, cultivate it and keep it. When he says, and keep it, that means he gave him the power to preserve what he gave him in terms of a job. So he gave him purpose and preservation. Purpose and preservation. Man has, was created to work and keep it. Let me give you a relationship point here. Sisters, if you have a man that has to work for you, Lord, y'all ought to see how the sister's looking right through here. Ooh, I'm in the house this morning. Watch this. Sisters, if you make a man work for you, he will work to preserve and keep you. You know where I'm going, right? But if you let him do whatever, I said if you let him do whatever, and have whatever, and enjoy whatever, without having to work for it, he won't work to try to keep it. Why would you work for something you easily got? Are y'all in here with me? So man was made with the natural tendency to be placed as a worker. And when he works for something, listen, let me tell you something. If you've been somewhere a long time, if you built that thing from nothing to something, you're going to do everything you can to do what? to keep it and let me just tell you that's a powerful principle that's pregnant in this text and paramount for relationships here it is if he won't work for it he will never try to work to keep it but he'll try everything he can to keep it once he has gotten what he has worked for am i right about it if you need some extra proof write this down don't go there but in genesis in the book of genesis i think it's verse uh chapter number 27 we find that when jacob uh when jacob wanted a uh, rachel the bible says that he worked seven years to get her i said the bible teaches us that he worked for seven years some of y'all ain't letting brother work seven days and then wondering why he don't want you no more. Baby, he, you already gave him what he wanted. He don't have to work no more to keep it. Amen, somebody. I'm in the house this morning. But I need to help you understand when you have a man that's willing to work for something, he will, he's willing to keep it. Amen, somebody. So what do we got so far, Brother Cleveland? Uh, God put the man together, planted him in the garden, placed him in, planted the garden for him, placed him in the garden, provided for him, gave him purpose and preservation. And the last thing you'll find uh, is in Genesis chapter 2, verses uh, 19, excuse me, 20 through 25, uh, he gave him a partner. Somebody shout partner. Let me tell you something. The Bible says that um, it's uh, not good for man in verse number 18 to be alone. I will make him a helper. Somebody shout helper. That is suitable for him. Uh, a man would never need for God to ever give him a helper if he ain't working. And you're wondering why he won't offer you. He won't receive your help because he never was a worker. And, and, and oh, I don't want to get too deep in that relationship thing, but let, let me just help you understand. This is what God did for mankind and made man. If you notice all of these seven P's, God gave it to him. He put them together, planted a garden for him. Watch this. Planted a garden for him. If you're willing to work, God will plant something for you and send you there so you can work in it. If you don't believe that, look at me. This is my ministry right here, y'all. <laughs> he planted this church and let me work in it. They met somebody. And I'm so thankful for that. And he placed him there, provided for him, and he gave him a purpose, gave him a job. Brothers got to have a job. Brothers have to have a job. There's no need for no help if he don't work. And he, God gave him with the ability to preserve it. And he gave him a partner when he gave him Eve. Amen, somebody. So that is how God uh, created the man. Amen, somebody. And I'm going somewhere with this. We're talking about godly men on this morning. Now, but today, you need to understand something. Uh, it has become quite clear that our culture is uh, being redefined in terms of how manhood is viewed. Manhood is changing in our culture and it's different distinctively different from what God has done to define it now usually when you have a major problem uh, with a product that no one can fix you can go to the manufacturer of that product who made the product am I right about it astonishingly when a car manufacturer realizes that something is awry or wrong with that product, there's a defect or 
uh, an issue or a problem with a major problem with a vehicle they what they usually do is they have a recall everybody shall recall now, now God has created every man but he knows that every man has some defects am I right about it has some issues some proclivities and some problems with their performance so today I believe that God is calling a recall on all men I said a recall on all men he meant somebody uh, to come back to what he originally intended for us to be am I right about it and what he intended for us to do here's the sermon here's the sermon here's the statement God wants us to restore godly manhood and sisters i need you taking even more notes than the brothers because if you're if you're trying to 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 find or, or be trusting god that god will bless you with somebody if you have some some nephews or some sons you need to be taking just as many notes as the brothers are right now amen somebody because god i believe is doing a recall today and he is wanting everybody to restore godly manhood let's say godly manhood together one two three a godly manhood one more time godly manhood i'm not talking about street manhood i'm not talking about drug dealer manhood and we're going to address all of these issues on today god wants all of us to restore godly manhood let me give you my first point to help you understand that and apply that and this is for everybody here godly manhood is restored when a man places his identity in Christ. If you want to restore godly manhood, godly manhood can be restored when a man places his identity in Jesus the Christ. Brothers, where is your identity? Is it in professional football? Is your identity in college football? Now, brother, brothers ain't saying nothing right now. Is it in the ESPN Sports Center? And I hope I'm, 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 I'm really going up in your nest this morning. And I need you to really think about what I'm saying to you today. Where is your identity? Is it really in Christ? Okay, now watch this. Okay, I, I knew when I asked that question what you would say. Uh, but is it truly in Christ? Watch this behaviorally. Now I know it's in Christ verbally. I, I know that. If I say is your be is, is your identity in Christ? Every brother, yeah, brother John, yeah, my identity is in Christ. Yeah, I know it's in Christ verbally. But is it is your identity in Christ behaviorally? And that's what God wants us to understand because uh, there are too many what I call pseudo masculine superficial stereotypes that our society uses to define manhood. Uh, our, our society is, is really off the chain because we describe manhood in a variety a different ways that are really superficial stereotypes of manhood and masculinity uh, and sometimes men believe that they are men because they're a provider or a hunter and, and we're taught as men that you know a man got to bring home the bacon and because of that we limit manhood to that one specific genre and we think that we're a man just because we're providing men has to provide that's that's just repleting the bible you got to listen if you don't work we, we understand that the text says that uh but i need you to understand that a lot of men place their identity and their masculinity in the fact that whether or not they can bring home the bacon but manhood is more than just being a hunter and a provider there are some people and watch this and let me tell you something here's the problem with when you place your manhood just in bringing home the bacon what if your job fire you 
Now you lost your manhood because you based your manhood. You limited your manhood to one specific genre of being a man. And since you lost that, now you got, that's why you will find that there will be a brother who uh, has four kids and all of a sudden he lost his job and he killed himself. You ever heard anything like that before? Because he lost his job. Well, why, why did he think to kill himself? It's because his, his whole identity of his manhood was, was based on his job. And when you limit yourself to just that, then you can mess yourself up because manhood is just more than being a provider. There are men that place their identity in being a fighter. Yeah, you, you, you know, you, you, some men know that, you know, if somebody come up to you, uh, you want to be the man that, you know, fixes every problem. Uh, where, where he at? I, I handle it, right? And then, you know, and, and that's, the, that's another problem, too, because if you got a brother that places his identity solely in him being the fighter, the one who supports everybody, he can mess around and make a bad decision and go and got to fight somebody or get into a shootout and get killed himself because his whole identity as a man is being a fighter. Amen. That's right. That's right. Yeah, you got to protect your family and protect your own. But to what degree that you place your manhood solely on that? So, you, so you'll be willing to die for something if you believe that your manhood is solely all that. And let me just say this and get this on the record and the radio and the Facebook and the TV. Here it is. A lot of brothers place their manhood on what women they could attract. All right, now. Work on it. All right. I got one brother uh, shouting this morning. I got one brother in here. Yeah. That's the brother that says, you know, I'm not a man unless I'm a stud. And their manhood is based off of how many women he can attract. And if he can't attract any women, then he does everything he can to become more attractive so that he could get more women because he believed that being a man is about how many women you could sleep with. Y'all not saying nothing in here this morning. There are a lot of brothers that believe that their manhood is based off of who they can attract. That's the brother that got to get a haircut every two days. And the, and the barber telling him, like, yo, I'm going to take your line back, man, if you keep coming to me. Because you don't, need, you don't even need another hat cut. But he feel like he got to put a whole bottle of cologne on. That's the brother in the club with a whole bottle of cologne on, y'all. He got to do something to attract somebody because his manhood is simply off the basis of whether or not of who he can attract. If he can't attract anything, he don't feel like he's a man. And while I'm on that, those are just pseudo masculine stereotypes that we have been cloned to believe in our culture. Somebody shout culture. And if you don't understand how God defines manhood, you will allow culture to define manhood. As a matter of fact, even right now in our culture, uh, men uh, have what you call personal autonomy. Men are into uh, self-expression. Men are into individualism. Men are into sexual freedom. Why? Because our culture accepts that kind of behavior from men. So a man says, man, why would I want to be with one woman and all these women out here in the world? Because the world accepts you having a thousand women. But that's not godly manhood. God says he wants you to have this many. Somebody shout this many, this many, this many. He wants you to have this many. But if you allow culture to dictate what's acceptable in terms of your masculinity and your manhood, you'll go with what culture accepts instead of what God says. Watch this. Let's go deeper, beloved. 71% of, of teen uh, pregnancies happen because of fatherlessness. 71% of high school dropouts happen because of fatherlessness. In case that's too big of a word for you, that means when the father's not around. So we don't realize that our children are being affected because the days of being a one woman man and being a spiritual man and sitting at the dinner table and praying and everybody holding hands together and coming to church and being involved in ministries and teaching your kid by taking your son out to go fish, show him how to play basketball and show him how to play football and show him how to be, put God first. Those days are soon to be over. 
because the world wants masculinity and manhood to be one way and we have adapted to what the culture says about male manhood and masculinity and forgot about what God says therefore it is affecting our children if you really want to understand the depth of what I'm discussing with you today beloved you will understand that the number one the number one and two reasons uh, why uh, <clears throat> this is taking place is because stay with me I'm about to go somewhere um, all of this is taking place number one because of divorce divorces are killing our families number two is children born out of wedlock that is causing the demise of the American family and the, divide, the, the, the demise of the American family starts with the husband or the father. And so if we don't have fathers restoring godly manhood, the cycle of what is going on with our children will continuously perpetuate and get worse. The best investment, I believe, in investing in stocks, Apple, get you some Apple stock, amen, somebody, get you some Home Depot stock, get you some, some Amazon stock, get all, get you some Starbucks stock, do all that stuff, amen, somebody, do all that. But the best stock you can invest in is people. Let me say it one more time. As we say in the country, one more again. Amen, somebody. Uh, the best investment that you can make is in your family. Because if a man, see, men have to be taught and trained. And if a man is not taught and trained, he won't know what to do. So what does he do? He has his pants down because he sees other boys at school do that. Watch this. Culture accepts it. And it's the important and the cool thing to do. But if he had a daddy, somebody shout a daddy. Somebody shout father. Go ahead. If he had a father that would not accept that and would not think that was cool and taught them the principle behind keeping your pants on your waist, he could act differently. Oh, let me move on. So I need to help you understand that we are living in the cultural climate, which is defining, dictating, and deciphering manhood. Therefore, the rise of all of these issues is going on right now. Fatherlessness is an epidemic. And I need to help us understand it's affecting high school dropouts, teen pregnancies, because the father is no longer in the house because sexual freedom self-expression individualism and personal autonomy is defining our manhood now and young men are going with that and they don't know any better because nobody has taught them and we got to do something about it today where are you going with this brother jones uh man godly manhood can be restored when you place your identity in the christ first corinthians chapter 11 and verse number three stay with me church now notice what paul said to the church at corinth first corinthians 11 uh, and verse number three, I want to get this into your spirit. Paul says to the church of Corinth, but I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man. In other words, Paul is saying, I'm not writing this to you for you to read it and say, oh, Paul, I read your letter. It was a great letter. It was good. I enjoyed it. <laughs> hey, and, I, and I want to pause parenthetically and tell you when you tell me that after I preach I really do appreciate you saying that but every preacher worth his salt who's really concerned about your soul salvation he just wants you to apply what he's teaching so what Paul is saying I, I don't want you to tell me I enjoyed your letter I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man so until Christ becomes your head, your identity has to be in somebody else or the world. I don't care what you say. Your identity is not in Christ until you make Christ your head. And if you don't make Christ your head, then you will be no good to the woman that you're with. But keep reading the text. And the man is the head of what? Sisters got to pause parenthetically right here. If he ain't made Christ his head, don't you make him. Woo! I'm in the pulpit right now. I'm in the pulpit right now. Let me help you understand. And that's what our sisters need to understand. He can't be your head, baby. If Christ is not his head. So Christ has to be the head. Watch this of every man our god he is alive praise him praise him the one who is alive